Well, here is the seventh tribe, brethren, the tribe of Gad. Now, of course, you all wonder who are the descendants of Gad today. Well, the descendants of Gad certainly, it might surprise you, they're found in a country which is ethnically mixed, though, but nevertheless, it does fulfill all the prophetic uh, pronunciations about Gad. And it is the country of Switzerland. And as you remember, Jacob, in Genesis 49, 49 verse 1, in the last days, he prophesied of all of his sons. That's in Genesis 49, 1. And then in Genesis 49, 19, he speaks about his son Gad. And he's speaking what the descendants of God will be doing in these last days. And he says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Now, in New King James Version, which many of you, I think, are using, it says, Gad, a troop shall troop upon him, but he shall troop on their heels. Now, how can we understand this? Well, if we know something from Switzerland and the Swiss history, we will remember that at the town of Marignano, today it's called Melagnano in Italy, in 1515, the Swiss army suffered terrible losses battling for the Italians against Francis I. The Francis I was the ruler of France. And this battle taught Switzerland that it is its only chance to survive as a free nation was to stay neutral. So Switzerland would not go to war again unless attacked. And then in 1815, the Congress of Vienna recognized Switzerland's permanent neutrality and present borders. So Switzerland has never been invaded since. And as you probably know, even during the Nazi occupation of Europe, Switzerland was did maintain its neutrality. Switzerland was an independent country and was not occupied by the Nazis. Now also there is something interesting from the history of Gad. So you see, troops, you know, troops overcame him, but Gad overcame at the last. In First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 8, and you can also find the same account in First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. We read that, And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David, into the hold, to the wilderness, men of might, and men of war, fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the rows upon the mountains. So this is description of the of those who were belonging to the tribe of Gad. We see that they are, you know, men of might, men of war, and their 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 faces were like the faces of lions. And they of course stood by David, the future king of all the United Israel. Now also to all of these prophecies, brethren, and all these biblical accounts, we can add Deuteronomy thirty three, verses twenty and twenty one. It is Moses prophetic utterance about God in the last days. So Moses added this prophetic insight about God. He says, Blessed be he who enlarges Gad. So blessed be he who enlarges Gad. That's of course the Old King James. Or there is in Jerusalem version of the Bible. It says, Blessed be he who gives God space enough. Now this is, keep in mind, these are all prophecies, brethren. Giving God space enough, enlarge as God. Then it continues, that prophecy says, He dwells like a lion and tears the arm with the crown of the head. Or, like Fenton's version says, Like a tiger, he crouches down and tears with his arms and jaws. So that's, you see, another part of the prophecy. Then it continues, And he provided the first part for himself, the Revised Standard Version says, And he provided the best of the land for himself. Because there, the prophecy continues, In a portion of the lawgiver was he seated, or as Fenton says, So was granted a princely home. So that's another prophecy. And then it says, And he came with the heads of the people, he executed the justice of the eternal and his judgments with Israel. He came with the heads of his people, of the people. That can be also uh, translated as Fenton has it. Uh, Fenton's rendering says, "Produced the leaders of men." Now that is very all interesting, brethren. These are the prophecies about Gad, descendants in the last days. 
In Judges chapter 10, verse 8, and you can also have a parallel scripture in Jeremiah 49, 1, Judges 10, 8, we read that that year the Philistines vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel who were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of Amorites, which is in Gilead. Now, in Gilead, in effect, it's actually God. It is the land of God, Gilead. And there is this beautiful song, there is a bomb in Gilead. Indeed. So Gilead was the land in the promised land. And as I know, I keep omitting the word Palestine because it was never called Palestine, brethren. It was called Palestine by Hadrian. Hadrian, the emperor, Roman emperor, called it Palestine out of his hatred for the Jews. But the promised land was never called Palestine. It was called the land of Canaan anciently. And later it was called Judea and Samaria. So we don't have Palestine. I mean, it's a made-up name, of course, used by plenty of anti-Semites today to say how the land is occupied by the non-Palestinians. Well, that's not the case. The land was given forever to the uh, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that land will be, as you know, following the second Exodus after the Great Tribulation, following the second Exodus, which will start in the day of the Lord. After the second exodus, the land will be completely populated by the Israelites. That's what is God's plan, whether people like it or not. That's the biblical truth. And again, if you have never heard my sermon about the second exodus, I would highly yet again recommend it because uh, it is one of the pivotal Bible truths that we need to keep in mind. So in any case, even in ancient promised land, as you see, God's struggle was to attain territory on the Moabite and Ammonite plateaus. So they were trying to, you know, gain the land and, and, and be settled there. And yes, you know, in Deuteronomy 33 verse 20, Moses' prophecy says, Yes, blessed, blessed is the one who helps God expand. Now you may wonder, what does, how is this being, brethren, fulfilled now by the modern descendants of God? Well, in this way. The Swiss Confederation started with three cantons in 20, sorry, in, in 1291, 1291. Only three cantons. And if you will Google now, you'll find that Switzerland has got much more cantons than, than three. Then it has expanded ever since until now. There are 23. In 14th century, there were eight cantons. In 15th century, they expanded to 10. In 1513, they expanded to 13. In the 16th century, they expanded to 14 cantons, and they kept expanding, brethren, until they now have 23 cantons. Switzerland also dwells like a lion. We have read that prophecy about their descendants, the descendants of God, because they are geared exclusively to fighting a defensive war. So the Swiss have developed, brethren, plans for destroying every tunnel, every bridge, every pass leading into Switzerland. And Switzerland has a very unique policy of armed neutrality, which is backed up by a national militia force, you know, numbering thousands upon thousands of people. And Switzerland has universal conscription for all men between the ages of 20 and 50. And the soldiers, interestingly enough, they keep their uniforms, they keep their equipment, guns and ammunition at home, and, you know, these items belong to them after they serve their term in the army. That's how it is being arranged in Switzerland. At the same time, we read that God will have best of the land. He'll take best of the land for himself. Well, brethren, Switzerland was a natural fortress. <coughs> it was easier to defend than to conquer. And though they were outnumbered, the Swiss, interestingly enough, always won. As we have just read in the prophecy, at the end, at last, they will win. They always won. Other cantons joined them in the next hundred years. And from the core of the first three, Switzerland grew outward. You see, Switzerland was expanding, brethren. That's how that prophecy is being was and was fulfilled in the days in the days past. And up until 1978, you know, Switzerland kept expanding, expanding to the present 23 cantons. Now, more cantons, as I said, joined during the next two centuries until there were 13. 
and then the Swiss defeated the Austrians in the battles of Morgarten in 1315 and they also defeated them second times at the Battle of Sempach in 1386 and they also defeated them at the Battle of Nafels in 1388. In all of those battles, as you can just well imagine, Switzerland kept expanding. In fact, recently in Europe, several months ago, uh, one of the Austrian uh, head of the Austrian province, one of the head of, the, of an Austrian province, he claimed that historically his province was actually belonging to Switzerland. And he also said that, you know, according to a census which was held sometime, I can't remember what year, the majority of the population of that province wanted to be part of the Switzerland. Interesting, brethren. So you see, that's how, that is how exactly the prophecy of expansion, blesses he who helps God expand, is and was and is being fulfilled. God has drastically expanded now. Now also in the battles of uh, St. Jacob near Basel, 1,500 Swiss fought off 20,000 French soldiers, killing about half of them. Now that's again fulfillment of the prophecy how the troops will, you know, troop upon God, but he will at the end, at last, you know, he will just overcome them. Also, did you know, brethren, that in the late 15th century, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, tried to conquer Switzerland and he was no more successful than the others had been. By 1499, the Swiss were independent of the so-called Holy Roman Empire, although their independence did not become official until the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. And because of their bravery, we read, you know, uh, how the description of those uh, uh, Gad tribe members, members of the tribe of Gad who, who joined David, the fame of the Swiss warriors brethren, spread throughout Europe and other countries wanted to hire them, so soldiers became one of Switzerland's main exports. Swiss soldiers fought for pay in the battles of many nations, but then the constitution of 1874 forbids this practice. However, if there is one guard that is kept in Vatican, brethren, it is a Swiss guard. The Vatican in Rome still has a Swiss guard and you can easily find it by googling it out. That's how famous the Swiss soldiers were. So the Swiss guard is there, you know, guarding and protecting the Pope. The mother of God, Leah, in Genesis 30 verse 11, she was very right when she said, A troop comes, and she called his name Gad. His name Gad meaning a troop. That's what the word Gad means. Now Switzerland, brethren, has produced... The leaders of men, as we have read in the prophecy, in many areas and fields. I'm sure that you know about that. Some of those perhaps renowned, in, especially in, in your countries, which are mostly Protestant, would be John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli. They were two of the great, greatest leaders of the Protestant Reformation. Then there is also Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Did you know he was a Swiss? Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the 18th century political and edu educational theorist. Uh, there is also Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi, the educational reformer. And there is, here is one, probably more known to you, Carl Gustav Jung and Jean Piaget. Those two are well known in Europe. They're giants in the development of modern psychological theory. Also, there are writers like Gottfried Keller and Jeremiah Gotthelf in the 19th century. And also the world famous today, I think he's the novelist, Hermann Hesse, and the playwright Friedrich Dürrement in the 20th century. Also in the area of arts and architecture, there are names like Henry Fuseli, Alberto Giacometti, Paul Klee, and Le Corbusier. You can find all of this in the Academic American Academic Encyclopedia in volume 18, page 396. So even the, uh, even the Americans have kept records of all these people. Some of these names are not known to us, but you know, names like Piaget, Jean Piaget, Carl Gustav Jung, Ulrich Zwingli is probably, are probably names that you would recognize. And probably the name Hermann Hesse. He was, in the 80s, he, he was translated in, in, in Serbia. He was very, very popular in Serbia in those days. I remember reading his famous book, Siddhartha, I think. Now, as far as the prophecy which says that God will be executing the justice of the eternal and his judgments. Well, brethren, how is that prophecy being fulfilled? Well, you see, Switzerland is a land 
where crime is virtually unknown. <laughs> we may wonder why. Well, you, you'll just you'll just make a logical conclusion from what you know about their conscription and their military service. You know. So crime is virtually unknown, yet you know most Swiss men are required by law to keep in their homes what amounts to a portable personal machine guns, or you know, to have to be always ready to defend their homeland should there should a need arise. So of course criminals are afraid that they will get shot in Switzerland, so they don't they don't commit crimes. And that's why in your news you will rarely if ever hear about any major crime being committed in Switzerland. Now they also have been able, the Swiss have been able to achieve a national peace by making other nations afraid of committing national crimes against them. So, I'm going to quote to you from an article that was uh, written by Bill Uselton entitled Freedom That Will Be The First To Go. And here is the quote, it was in American's Promise newsletter published in April 1989. It says the government of Switzerland feels the same way our founders did about bearing arms. Every able-bodied man in Switzerland is a member of the militia and has a machine gun or sniper rifle in his home with ammunition. Switzerland also has the lowest crime rate in Europe. Now where could you find some traces historically of, of the tribe of Gad? Well you can find it in a Bering province of Persia near India, in Strabon's records, the land was called Gedrosia. Also, there was a town, well-known town in Spain today, Gades or Gadesium or Gadis or Gadira, and it is a town of the Spanish coast, 25 miles from the Pillars of Hercules. It was sometimes called Tartessus and Erythea. And it was named Erythea after the Erythites, who are, num who are mentioned in Numbers 26, verse 16. So we have all of this information from Pliny. And now the town, brethren, is known by the name Cadiz. Cadiz. So the uh, members of the tribe of Gad are actually the founders of the Spanish town of Cadiz. Also Hercules, it was surnamed Gaditanus, a leader of a man and a lion. And, you know, there is a cel celebrated temple was there, you know, to his honor. Now, the inhabitants of that land were called Gaditani, Pliny tells us, and Stra Strabon as well. So, historically, this is where we find the name of Gad in various geographical locations. But nowadays, plenty of them are, you know, located in Switzerland, we have the uh, name God, it's found in Burgundian and Engadin, in Graubunden, these are all names in Switzerland. And also the famous town St. Gallen comes from Gaul or Gilead, where Gad lived. So now we have seen how the prophecies in the last days related to the tribe of Gad are being fulfilled brethren in our time the bible never lies the bible is the book of the books and whatever is written in the bible brethren is always true amazing enough as you can see the prophecies that are being fulfilled now before our own eyes are actually the prophecies given in the very first book of the bible genesis and also given in the very first five books of the bible genesis to deuteronomy called the torah meaning broadly translated the instruction so we have in the first five books of moses brethren we have even instructions about the world history today many people are not aware of that and they think that the torah is something outdated something irrelevant to their salvation all these things that we're discussing about the tribes of israel all these details yes i'll admit they're not the matter of salvation indeed but however they are an instrument to convince us how truthful and how precise and how God-inspired the book that we read, the Bible, is.